What's going on, my friends? Welcome back to another episode of Market Watch Mondays. As always, I am your host at Mike Me Up with two Ps. I'm happy to be back. It's a beautiful. Sorry, I almost just knocked over all my bottles there, but it's a beautiful Sunday. It's Super Bowl weekend, Super Bowl Sunday. I'm recording this show uh, Sunday uh, in the morning, I guess early afternoon before the game is played. So I will not know the results of that. But that's okay because I'm not really talking money of that. And that's not really relevant for a lot of the fantasy uh, stuff that we'll be talking about today. Uh, but, you know, I just got back, actually, a uh, pretty fun weekend out in Napa. I uh, uh, took the girlfriend out there, and we enjoyed uh, nice some R&R relaxation. Uh, went on some wine tastings, went on some champagne tastings, went ate a bunch of food, you know, did the whole did the whole shebang. It was fun. But now I'm glad to be back in the studio grinding, talking about some football stuff, right? But before we get to the football, if you're new to this channel, or not new to the channel, sorry, new to the show on this channel, you don't know what time it is, but if you're not new and you came over for bunk bed breakdowns, man, y'all know what time it is. Hit that intro. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, so today, uh, the main topic I want to talk about is startup draft strategy for the Dynasty offseason. And specifically, I want to talk about some players that I'm definitely going to be targeting in my startup drafts. Now, if you guys have bought the BDG draft guide in prior years, you'll know that my strategy is mostly centered around trading back, punting year one, and then trying to build a build a monster over the next two years to kind of dominate uh, for the remainder of the next half decade or so. But I think, you know, I mentioned it a little bit uh, in a prior video this year, but this year, I think I'm going to pivot a lot and not necessarily pivot out of trading back, but pivot into trading, uh, drafting a lot a, a lot of veteran players. And I want to go through some of the veterans that I think are an incredible value, but I really do believe as a general ethos for this year, there is no better year to win now than, than this year, because there's two factors at play here. One veterans are going at an incredible discount in dynasty adp and what i'm using as my source here is keep trade cut if you guys don't know what keep trade cut is it is a crowdsourced crowdfunded data set that forms an adp so every time you go on the site it makes you rank three players so there's thousands and thousands of data sets on this so i prefer this site uh, a lot more to mock drafts because one mock drafts is stale data and it's on a monthly basis but two uh this is being fed from a much much bigger sample size and a much much bigger population it's not just the mock draft made up of you know your favorite analysts and you know some other people they, they farmed off twitter right it's not that i, I hate that type of data because it's not very accurate it's not really realistic even keep trade cut has its own flaws but i think it's the it's the best we got right it's the best of the it's the best of everything else uh so i really like what they're doing over there uh they actually take feedback in from the user base so make sure you guys go interact with them go check out their site it's pretty cool um you know sometimes i'd say that keep trade cut my the one flaw with them is they they do tend to really, really heavily favor uh, youth and really, really be uh, a lot more reactive. But, you know, that's part of the dynasty market, too. Everyone says, you know, you don't be reactive. But I promise you, I play in a lot of dynasty leagues. Everyone is very, very reactive. So it's just the nature of the beast. But I'm using them as my source to identify some of these values. So one, I find that veterans values, uh, league, specifically league winning veterans. Like we don't care about the veterans that don't have a meaningful impact on your win loss uh, outcome, but the ones that do have a, that can play a very, very meaningful factor and provide you that league winning upside. A lot of those guys are going out a big discount this year, just because of the chaos of COVID last year, all the injuries. It was a very, very injury ridden year. We hear it every year, like this year's injuries are the worst, but last year's injuries was literally the worst. I, have, I do not remember in 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 season that was that bad in terms of injuries right Uh, at the running back position specifically but also at the quarterback position that was a very very brutal for those of us that play super flex so that's one factor two we know the 2023 class is already propped up to be one of the greatest classes of all time which is really saying something given the flux of talent that we've had in recent years if you look at the wide receiver position between 2020 2021 2019 we've had absolute studs like if you look at the wide receiver one top 12 wide receivers overall like most of them all came from those classes and not just because they're young but because those got those classes produced incredible talent at the position right and 2020 obviously produced incredible talent at the running back position with guys like Jonathan Taylor DeAndre Swift etc cetera, etc cetera. but 2023 is projected to even outdo that right you have Jackson Smith out of Ohio State one of the top wide receivers in the nation you have Keyshawn Boutique one of the top wide receivers in the nation you have 
Uh, Bijan Robinson, who I already said is already a top three, top five running back out the gate. Uh, he's incredible. Uh, you have a, a bunch of other guys back there as well, like Tank Tank Bigsby. Um, you have um, you know the player out of Georgia as well. So there's there's just a lot of talent, a lot of talent out there. Not Georgia, sorry, Georgia Tech. Um, a lot of talent out there at the position, and it's going to be incredible. So both of those factors come into play because everyone's going to be itching and scrambling to get those 2023 20, picks. Personally, I'm not buying 2023 20, picks anymore. I've already accumulated a mass of them uh, like a year ago. That's when I was buying them when they were a lot cheaper. But now you have that confluence of factors, which means that you can probably use your 2023 20, picks and buy startup picks one to one. Like you can probably trade your 2023 20, first and get like a top three, top four round pick in, in the coming draft. And that's a big difference. You're, and you'll, you'll see some of the players I go through there. But you're going to be able to create some monster, monster teams this season, right? And that's why I think if I do any startup drafts, I'll probably only do one or two because I'm trying to cut leagues this year. But if I do any, I think you're going to be printing money by going uh, by building a win now team in 2020 in 2022, um, because like you don't have to draft that many rookies because the class isn't that strong, right? And you can use future draft capital in 2023 to really arm yourself up, add a couple extra startup picks, and you can build out a really, really good team with a lot of depth, all right? So I think just think about those factors in your mind as I go through the players, and I'll go through the players that I want to pick pick on, and I'm sure there's many other options, but these are the ones that really, really stick out to me in terms of league winning upside, all right? Round one. There are a couple players here where I would want to go after, and this is a year where I don't necessarily want to trade out of the first round because I can get these guys at, in, at the later first round pick. What I would be willing to do, though, is if I can land a top three pick, right? You know, a Josh Allen, you know, Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert, who seem to be forming the clear tier one of quarterback. If I can get one of those picks, if I can trade from there back into like the 1.07, 1.08 and add a future pick on top, you know, add a second round pick, add a a swap, uh, maybe add a first round pick. If you're lucky, if you have the 1.01, maybe you can try and squeeze out like a 2024 first to move back to the later part of the first round. I would be looking to make those types of moves, but I do want to stay in that back part of the first. And this is why number one on my list. Number one in one A one B, Lamar Jackson, Kyler Murray, currently going as a QB six and QB uh, QB five, I think QB QB five and QB six overall. So Kyler Murray is going at one point zero eight, Lamar Jackson going at one point zero nine. If I can land either of these players at that position, I am laughing to the bank, because this is why. With Lamar Jackson, we've seen his two worst performances in the last couple of years this prior year mostly because of injury uh he was doing pretty hot um but obviously he had a ton of injuries this year so wasn't doing too well on that front and he burned a lot of people he burned me you know i'm a big lamar jackson bag holder because i went heavy on him in 2019 because he and he won me a lot of leagues that year uh but obviously this year was a little bit more painful because he was hurt but this was his points per game, right? He was still rocking a 20, 22 uh, points per game in 2021, uh, 25 points per game in 2020, 2020. And that was like low end QB1 average numbers on, on average. But that is his floor. And his ceiling, we've seen the ceiling is 31.9 points per game, QB1 overall in 2019. Uh, do I think he'll ever reach that again? No. But the floor that he provides on a week to week basis and also on a seasonal basis makes him one of the most um, one of the most, I guess, you know, highly valued assets in Dynasty. He's also only 25 years old. He's going to improve. We've seen him improve year over year as a passer. The people that say that he cannot pass and he's not has not improved are just I don't know what they're watching and they're they're not. I guess they ignore all the numbers. But from a number perspective, he has improved year over year. I know there's gonna be a lot of haters that say, hey, he can't throw. He's just a running quarterback. He's running back. Yada yada yada. Whatever. But from a fantasy perspective, he is a slam dunk pick at that price, right? Because he's going to be, he basically forms your core, right? You grab, you grab him in the back part of the first, and that's going to form your basis on a week to week basis. And that's going to build the floor of your team, right? Him or Kyler Murray. Kyler Murray is even more perplexing, right? Because even though he had us down 2021, he was still the QB six overall, 24 points per game. Uh, and, and then he was QB eight the year before that, 26.4 points per game. And, you know, we know he actually got injured as well towards the back half of the season. I know there's a lot of FUD out there about Kyler Murray. Um, you know, people are saying he's not a natural leader. He's not this, he's not that Arizona's not going to move on from him. He's the best chance they have at winning. They just had their best season, uh, ever. Uh, even though they were playing with the fraud cliff Kingsbury, fake, uh, fake sharp, the ultimate fake sharp, the king of fake sharps, Cliff Kingsbury out there. You know, Kyle Murray came out and said he was set up to fail. Probably shouldn't have said that. That's probably immature. And he is, and he's still a kid. So he is probably immature on that end. But in terms of raw talent and ability, in terms of rushing upside, 
there's really no one better than these two. These guys are, I mean, them plus like Josh Allen, obviously, but these are the elite of the elite in terms of rushing upside. So for me, they are top five quarterbacks and it may not seem like much, right? Because they're valued at QB six, QB seven uh, on KTC, but that is a big teardrop. So if I can get them for that price, to me, that's a big, big, big W. And personally, you know, players going ahead of them, Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson. I love Jamar Chase. I love Justin Jefferson. They are, they form my tier one of wide receivers, but whenever I have wide receivers in that dynasty wide receiver one overall slot, I'm always looking to pivot off. And if I can get a quarterback, uh, as good as Lamar Jackson, as good as Kyler Murray to build my team around, I'm happily giving up any of those players and Joe Burrow. Don't get me wrong. Also an outstanding player, but he just does not have the same rushing upside. So he's much more TD dependent. And we know those can be fluky a little bit year over year and having, having, Jamar Chase having T Higgins definitely helps him a lot on that end, but you can see the week to week volatility on his, uh, on his games and it, it's a lot more wild, right? So I would much rather have Lamar Jackson and Kyler Murray. So the fact that you can get any of these guys for cheaper than them is a big, big W and you squeeze out a little bit of margin. It's really, really hard to squeeze out margin in the first round, but these two players offer you the upside. And I just want to give a brief mention to Trey Lance currently going at 1.12. Trey Lance had, uh, he played three games total, right? In, in, in 2021. And in two of those games, he scored 23 points or more. In one of those games that he scored, uh, in his worst game, he scored 15 points. He's passed for less than 200 yards, and he threw a pick. That's the power of the Konami Code quarterback, right? And we know that he's a very, very raw prospect. He has to develop, but we know his arm talent. So, and he plays in a good offense. He plays with good offensive players between Brandon Ayuk, Debo Samuel, George Kittle. That makes it very easy for a player like him to succeed. So, you know, we know Jimmy Grant, uh, Jimmy Garoppolo's days are numbered so at qb qb7 overall price for trey lance uh at the back part of the first if you do want to go a little bit younger and take a little bit more risk you can afford to do it with a trey lance because you'll see the other guys that i pick in the later rounds that can really help support uh the floor of your team but if you want to build around a trey lance it's very very possible and i think he's a still a great pick or great value at that price all right now we're going to round two and this is where it gets beautiful right Christian McCaffrey sitting there round two, 2.08 as a running back five at pick 20, pick 20 of the second round. Like that is an insane value to me. Let's, I don't think people really understand how great Christian McCaffrey is, right? So in this season, obviously he was injury ridden, right? He's in, he, he burned people last year, burned people yet again this year. I understand if you don't want to take that risk for me, I'm a risk maxi chaser because I'm trying to chase the upside to go for that win. And there's no one that provides more league winning upside than Christian McCaffrey. And frankly, it's not even close. This is not debatable. A, a healthy Christian McCaffrey is worlds above everyone else. Worlds above Jonathan Taylor, worlds above Derrick Henry, worlds above everybody, right? He is the only player that can really give you 27 points per game upside floors with no touchdowns, right? If you look at his 2021 season, he had 24 points per game plus in any game that he played more than 50% of the snaps, right? And in those games, he averaged 25.85 points per game. That would have been quarterback four, and he only scored two touchdowns. That is insane. The points per game leader in 2021 was Derrick Henry and their RB1 overall with Jonathan Taylor, who, who you know, obviously played the full season healthy. Henry averaged 24.3 points per game. Jonathan Taylor did not crack 22 points per game. So that is a nearly two to three three to four points per game margin average that someone like Christian McCaffrey is giving you. And I get it. Health, health. People are saying he's injury prone. People are saying he's easy, he's, he's fucked. Look, this is the thing with running backs. Any running back is going to cross the, the, the threshold for injury risk because it's a very violent position. It's a very, very violent position. Jonathan Taylor could get injured next season at any given time. He can blow out his ACL, right? Christian McCaffrey's injuries, at least they aren't like to the same knee, to the same leg every single time, right? And we've seen him be extremely healthy from college all the way through the first two years. So are these injuries more fluky in nature? Are they more recurring? Are they more risky? I'll leave it for you to decide. I know there's some guys on um, on Twitter, like FB Injury Doc, who's one of my favorites. Uh, you know, he said the risk is worth the reward. And to me, the risk is absolutely worth the reward, right? You can get injured and still be good later on. I do not think Christian McCaffrey's days are done. And if you look at what he's been able to do before, it's insane. Like 2020, 
Obviously, season cut short, but he's averaging 30 points per game in that season. In 2019, his magical season, he averaged 29.4 points per game, which would have been good for quarterback two behind Lamar Jackson who scored 31 points. So this is a player that can give you quarterback production in the running back slot with a weekly floor that is absolutely unmatched in PPR for us because of how heavily involved he is in the receiving game. And with Christian McCaffrey, the, the beauty of him is I think I can see him aging a little bit better than some of the other running backs because... He is legitimately one of the best receivers in the league. He's not just a dump-off pass guy. If you look at his PFF grades from a receiving perspective, if you look at his efficiency, if you look at what he's been able to do as a receiver, Christian McCaffrey is by himself in terms of receiving running backs. You could line him up as a wide receiver later on in his career as a slot wide receiver, and he would be a fantasy uh, he would be a fantasy viable asset. And that's, that's the beauty of a Christian McCaffrey. So the fact that you can get him for running back five, Running back five in the second round right now, it blows my mind. I would take him all the wide re- over uh, almost all the wide receivers ahead of him. I would definitely take him over the rookie running backs like Najee and um, and Javante Williams. Um, but the fact the fact is like it's insane that he's being valued this low, and I get it, it's injury risk. But those who play to win the game, you got to take a little bit of risk, right? You got to take a little bit of risk. And Christian McCaffrey can still sink you, but at the second round, at the second round price tag, that doesn't kill your team if he doesn't play a full season, right? And uh, personally, I don't expect any of my running backs to play a full season. It's just a matter of if they get lucky of when when they play and when they don't, right? And obviously this season, he basically got shut down because their team fucking sucked, right? There's no need to ri- risk him out there and keep trotting him out there. So he's going to have the time to recover. He's going to have a full offseason to recover. We'll see what happens. But for me, because it's not a, uh, it's not like a nagging recurring Injury, he didn't injure the same spot both times, both major times. I'm betting on Christian McCaffrey to make it back. This guy's a freak. He's a cyborg. I think he's going to do really, really, really well. The next two guys I want to talk about. First up, Tyreek Hill, currently going at 2.09 wide receiver 7. Now, I'm not necessarily going to have as much Tyreek Hill because he is going back-to-back with Christian McCaffrey, but I wanted to mention here, for those of you guys that do like to draft 0RB draft, but I picked 21 overall. He's the wide receiver 7, and he finished as a wide receiver 7 in 2021. Uh, at 27 years old. So this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me for taking CD Lamb over Tyreek Hill. No, thank you. I still think Tyreek Hill is in the elite of the elite. This is the first time in his career he cracked 140 targets. He hit 159 targets, which is good for a 23% target share. So Tyreek Hill is still the top dog of the of that offense. The difference is this year, he didn't score that many touchdowns, right? And same with last year. But we know he absolutely has like that 14, 15%, 15 touchdown upside in him because we've seen it before. And when that hits... He's going to be the wide receiver one overall, right? So uh, if I were to bet next season who are the best chances at winning wide receiver one overall, Tyreek Hill is at the top of my list because he has done it before and he's playing in a really good offense and he's commanding a very large target share and he's finally getting peppered with targets. So, and you know, I, I get it. People got burned with him because I think he had two games with less than 50% snatch share because he had some, uh, he had some soft, uh, soft tissue injuries. Uh, which really actually dragged down his points per game, which made him that wide receiver one overall, wide receiver seven points per game overall. But going into next season, I do think Tyreek Hill is going to continue to feed. He's going to continue to dominate. So if you're building a win now team, right, getting your wide receiver one, if you want to build a zero, zero RB build, getting your wide receiver one overall uh, as Tyreek Hill in the second round is an absolute steal, right? And Similarly, in that same vein, you can also get Devontae Adams in the third round. So this is probably one where I might prefer a little bit. He's going at pick 29, which values him at wide receiver 11 overall. I get it. He's 29 years old, so it might be that DeAndre Hopkins type of thing. But I do think he's a much different player, or at least not much different, but a little bit different player than DeAndre Hopkins. He was already, he's still the wide receiver too in 2021, first of all. Um, he's rocking a 28% target share, which is elite. That is absolutely like top 99.9 percentile in terms of target share. He's go, so he has a target volume. The question marks obviously are around Rodgers, right? Does he, is Aaron Rodgers gone? Is Aaron Rodgers retiring? Is he going to stay? There's a lot of question marks there. But when you have an elite talent in Devontae Adams, like you're basically drafting him at his floor of wide receiver 11. I don't see Devontae Adams finishing outside of the top 12 wide receivers, even if he's not playing with Aaron Rodgers, right? He's he's at that point where his career, where if he does go somewhere, he's probably going to go to a better team, right? He's not trying to retire uh, on some shit team and not have a chance at the Super Bowl or not have a chance at playoffs even. So I think he's going to go to a better team. And if he goes to a better team, he's going to be the best player there because there aren't that many wide receivers that are better than Devontae Adams, right? If And... He was the wide receiver two overall in 2021. He was the wide receiver one overall the year before by a wide margin, having one of the best seasons ever before Cooper Cup did his thing this year. But, you know, I get it. There's risk there. But when you draft someone like him in the third round to win, 
you're not taking on that same amount of risk as you as if you would have drafted him in the first round or the second round so you have a lot of room to play there uh play with there in terms of downside but to me one of the best wide receiver values is stefan diggs stefan diggs going in round four at pick 39 4.03 overall He's going as a wide receiver 14, even though he just finished as the wide receiver 10 in 2021 with a 25% target share, 169 targets, uh, which is the same amount of targets as last year. And last year, he finished as a wide receiver three overall with 20.5 points per game because they were a lot more. Uh, it looks like they were a lot more on the same page last year. They were connecting a lot more. So even though he had the same amount of targets this year, he had a lot less receptions, a lot less yards. I think like 200, 300 less yards. So that's what makes it for the points per game difference. But he's still only 20. I think he's 28 years old. So I'm not going to be drafting all these young guys over Stefan Diggs in the fourth round, because if you think about the draft so far, what can you do? You could have gone Lamar Jackson in round in round one, CMC in round two in round three. You could have grabbed a Tyreek. You could have grabbed a Devonte Adams or, and then in round four, you could have grabbed a Stefan Diggs. So you could have in that combination, a top five quarterback, in my opinion, the number one overall running back, right? and two wide receivers that have top five upside with a wide receiver one overall floor and that's an incredible start to us to the to the draft and you don't even need to trade up to do any of that right and that's the beauty of this year. that's why i think it's so easy to play to win now this year is because you don't need to trade up at all to get any of these guys and and like i said what you can do is probably trade a 2023 first in to get another pick in the third round get another pick in the fourth round so you can get all of Stephon Diggs, Tyreek Hill, Devontae Adams, you can probably get those guys for a 2023 first round pick. And that is an incredible amount of value to have at the wide receiver position. So I really like to build my teams around having one really, really good running back and then stacking a bunch of high upside wide receivers. And if I can set a starting lineup with Lamar Jackson, CMC, Devontae Adams, and Stephon Diggs, or Tyreek Hill and Stephon Diggs, you are laughing to the fucking bank all day long, right? This is the amount of value that you can have with these guys. And they might be a little bit older, but believe it or not, wide receiver wide receiver production does not fall off a cliff at age 28, right? Their value does because Dynasty Gamers are like, hey, fuck those guys. They're old now. But from a production perspective, a lot of them can produce you know, well into their early 30s, you know, 30, 31, 32, right? You saw it with Julio Jones. And the reason why I like these guys and I chose them as targets is because someone like a Devontae Adams, Stephon Diggs, they are very, very good route technicians. They are two of the best, if not the best route runners in the league, right? And they can easily translate uh, later on in the career from an outside primary wide receiver to more inside the slot. You already see a lot of it. A lot of Devontae Adams, he is killing guys in the slot because people realize they move him in there and you can't really double him. And he is probably the nastiest release off the line that anyone has ever seen, uh, at, at least in the modern era. And he's able to burn defenders that way. And you can do that well into your later years when your athleticism falls off a little bit you know the knowledge the the, the route running and the experience is really comes into play and i think both of them their games translate very well into the early 30s and they can translate very well into the slot kind of like old man larry fitzgerald who produced a couple of pretty good seasons even in his mid 30s so i really really like those guys uh targeting them because you buy them you buy them with the intention that they retire on your roster right and that's great because i think in the next two to three years this is your window you, you can win this year. You can probably win again next year with these guys because Christian McCaffrey, believe it or not, he is still only uh, 25 or 26 years old, 26 years old, I think. So, and if you look at a Christian McCaffrey, like the biggest, the best comparison for him is someone like LaDainian Tomlinson, Marshall Falk, et cetera, in terms of their play styles. And those guys produce top five running back seasons well into their late 20s and early 30s. So you're building this team to have a great, great win window within the next two years, but you also have guys like Lamar Jackson, Kyler Murray that you can rebuild around. So once these guys kind of flame out, you can trade them away for late first round picks, you know, second round picks, whatever, and start your rebuild in two to three years. But you have a very, very good substantial win now window. So that's some of those guys, but here's some more guys I want to talk about as well. If you want to go a little bit younger at the wide receiver position, Deontay Johnson. So I famously, not famously, cause I'm not that famous, but I stupidly, uh, underrated Deontay Johnson for the last couple of years. But if you look at his numbers, there's nothing not to like. He's 25 years old. He's currently going in the fourth round at, at pick uh, at pick 40-something. Uh, so he's going as a wide receiver 15. So he's not even valued as a wide receiver one overall, uh, as a wide receiver one, a top 12 wide receiver. Even though in 2021, he was a wide receiver nine in points per game, 17 points per game, 12 games with 10-plus 
targets, right? 12 games with 10 plus targets. Let that sink in. That type of target volume is monstrous. Again, another player with 160 plus targets. I've just named Devontae Adams, Stephon Diggs, Tyreek Hill, and uh, and now Deontay Johnson, all guys with 160 plus target upside, right? He only has two games with less than two targets. And yet, for whatever reason, we want to value him as a wide receiver too. There's no reason that Deontay Johnson shouldn't be going ahead of a lot of guys like Terry McLaurin. Um, there's a good argument to be made for putting Deontay Johnson kind of in that same grouping as CeeDee Lamb, to be honest with you. But for whatever reason, you can get Deontay Johnson plus a first for CeeDee Lamb potentially. And I would do that trade 10 times out of 10 because what Deontay Johnson offers is really, really good for you. But also he's still young. He's 25. He's not even truly in his maximum prime yet. So if you want to couple him with an older receiver, maybe you go Devontae Adams and Deontay Johnson in the fourth round. Maybe you go uh, Tyree Kill and De Deontay Johnson. Then you're looking at an average age of your top wide receivers in the 26, 27 seven range where you can still capitalize on the value before they hit the value cliff and you get all the massive production they have to offer. So those are the top wide receivers that I'm targeting in the top part of the rounds. And again, you can trade in, you can trade one of your 2023 20, first round picks and probably get Deontay Johnson plus because that's how much people are fiending over the 2023 first round picks, right? And the other last two players I want to talk about is another quarterback to complete your Superflex duo uh, as Russell Wilson and another running back we'll talk about later. But Russell Wilson currently going as a QB 11 overall in the fourth round at 4.02, pick 38. He was the QB 14 in 2021, but a couple of things to keep in mind. Even though he's a QB 14, still offered you 20 points per game, but that includes games where he three games where he scored less than seven points, and that was when he came back from having that like broken finger um, uh, injury. And he start, but he started off the year really, really hot, right? He started off the year really, really hot. Uh, he was averaging 26 points per game, 26.64 uh, points per game before the finger injury. So that would have been good for QB four overall. And if you look at his history in 2020, QB six overall, 2020, 2019, QB seven overall. Russell Wilson is a freaking stud. There is no reason why he should be going as a low end quarterback, right? He should be going, in my opinion, still in the second round at the latest in the third round. But I really do think given Superflex and the value of quarterbacks, elite quarterbacks, he could have, he could be going in the second round. You can make a very, very good description for him going in the second round. And he's an elite quarterback. That's the thing. He's not just a good fantasy quarterback. He is an elite real life quarterback. And I get it. The mainstream media is dumping on him right now and saying how he's not elite. You know, you got Ryan Clark over there on uh, whatever, ESPN, Fox, whatever, one of those shitty shows that, that he's on saying that he's not elite. You know, compared to the Big Ben, which was hilarious because Russell Wilson is way better than Big Ben on every single level. Um, but from a fantasy perspective, people feel like he got burned. And I got burned by Russell Wilson, right? Because he he was absolute dog shit for a couple of those games coming back from his in, uh, finger injury, which is expected because, duh, you need your goddamn fingers to throw a quarterback, to throw a football accurately. And... He burned, he burned a lot of people, but if you look at his performance later on in the year, he was an absolute monster. He was on fire. In the championship week, he scored like 36 points. So if you had Russell Wilson on your team, that was probably a league-winning performance, uh, assuming you got there with him. So for, to me, though, having Russell Wilson in the fourth round is incredible because now, if you think about what I did in the draft, you can draft Lamar Jackson right in the back part of the first, and you can draft Russell Wilson. So that's your two quarterback slots. Lamar Jackson plus Russell Wilson will absolutely win you leagues if they stay healthy. And for me, I'm betting on the history of Russell Wilson. He's only 33 years old, right? 33 years old. He's probably still got another three to four years left in the tank, right? He's not going to be that game-winning, you know, rushing quarterback, even though he still does a decent amount of rushing. So he's still got the Konami code in him uh, that he had, that he wasn't, but he won't be as good as he was early on in the career, but he still has massive TD upside. He's the, he's the entire offense of Seattle. And if he goes somewhere else, even better. He'll have, I mean, not probably not even better, but if you go somewhere else, he'll still be an elite level quarterback that changes the team, despite what mainstream media might want you to think. But I do think Russell Wilson is that game breaker. Um, he is an absolute elite quarterback and someone that I'm happy to bet on and draft in the fourth round. He's probably one of the best values available at quarterback. If you were to tell me that like you can get Russell Wilson in the fourth round, that offers a lot of flexibility for you. Cause if you don't land a Lamar Jackson, you don't land a Kyler Murray, what you can do is go for a little bit younger value in like you know in one of the wide receivers or just double up on running back you go like uh christian mccaffrey and uh christian mccaffrey and 
you know, Austin Eckler, for example, you can grab those guys to start. And then Russell Wilson will be your quarterback one and you grab another value play later on, like a Kirk Cousins, who's a favorite of mine every single year. Uh, Ryan Tannehill, even hopefully for hoping for a bounce back here or there. But you have a lot of options there. Or you can go uh, younger with Trey Lance right in the first round and support him with a Russell Wilson, where that way you're not all old on your team. So you can, there's a lot of ways to build to win and still maintain balance in your squad. Right. And then the last player I want to talk about is Saquon. Barkley Saquon Barkley currently pick number 48 end of the fourth round as the running back 13 overall that is mind-blowing to me because Saquon Barkley has been incredible for the early part of his career and he's burned people this year but if you think let's look back at 2021 let's see what happened right 2021 we were already expecting him to miss games to start the season because he was still on the recovery right they brought him back in and eased him back in a little bit. First two games, he didn't do much. It was horrible, which is as expected because I wasn't even expecting him to play. And then he went off, right? He went off for two games in typical Saquon Barkley fashion. And then what happened? Another fluke injury because someone stepped on his ankle, right? Like these are injury prone. Like that term is thrown around a lot, but it really takes, you know, more digging to kind of understand what happens between players like Christian McCaffrey and Saquon Barkley. Like are, are they injury prone? Or are they a little bit unlucky, right? And I think it's probably a little bit mix of both. Does Saquon Barkley carry more risk than he did before? Absolutely. It would be foolish to not recognize that. But at the pick of pick 48 in the fourth round, hitting on a Saquon Barkley can be league winning because we know what a healthy Saquon Barkley can do. Uh, despite playing on a shitty offense, which is what he did in his rookie year, a healthy Saquon Barkley has running back one, Sorry, not running back one. Running back two overall upside, assuming Christian McCaffrey is healthy. Because as long as Christian McCaffrey is healthy, he is in a tier by himself. There's no point comparing him with anyone else. But Saquon Barkley can absolutely be in that tier and lead that tier below him. Would it surprise me at all next year to see Saquon Barkley outproduce Jonathan Taylor? Not at all. If Saquon Barkley is healthy, I can absolutely see that happening. But more importantly, Giants totally clean house. Gettleman, gone, right? Friggin' the coaches, gone, right? Um, Jason Garrett gone. He's awful. Uh, and when Jason Garrett was gone, people were excited about the offense. I still wasn't excited because I knew that Freddie Kitchens was coming in and we've seen what Freddie Kitchens does, does with an offense in the Cleveland Browns. He's awful. Uh, can't actually do that. So, but now they bring in an offensive minded coach in, uh, dabble, uh, is it Brian dabble? Well, whatever the, the Buffalo bills, uh, offensive coordinator, right? And so they're bringing him over. Uh, to the Giants offense. So I'm very excited to see what they do with the offense, but more, most excited about Gettleman being out because maybe now they can finally build through the draft. Like the New York Giants have, have had top 10 draft picks like year after year after year after year, right? And they've done nothing with it because Gettleman's an idiot, right? But now they can actually potentially, hopefully build a better team around Second Barkley. I'm bullish around the Giants offense in the sense that it couldn't get much worse than what it was before, right? But more importantly, you also don't need that much of a that that good of an offense in order for a running back to produce. Is it better for your offense? Absolutely. But what, what you need is volume. And Saquon Barkley now can hopefully have a healthy workout offseason, start the year fresh, come back as the Saquon Barkley that we know, and avoid some of these nasty fluke injuries like someone stepping on his ankles, right? So if I look at Saquon Barkley, I prefer him over almost a lot of the running backs going ahead of him. I prefer him over Chubb. I prefer him over uh, Dalvin Cook. I pre definitely prefer him over Akers. And you guys know I'm one of the biggest Akers fans out there, but there's no way that I'm drafting uh, Cam Akers a full round ahead of Saquon Barkley. It just doesn't make any sense. A full, Almost a full two rounds. I would take him ahead of Gibson. Uh, I think it's a in more interesting conversation with Mixon, but I would still take him ahead of Mixon. And then I th really think the convo should be Saquon Barkley versus the Najee Harris or Javante Williams. But the value is not even like that. You don't even have to make that decision because the market is being so kind and generous with Saquon Barkley. The market is telling me that you can get Saquon Barkley plus a future rookie first, maybe a 2024 first for a Najee Harris and Javante Williams. And if you can get that deal done, you should be getting that deal done in every single league that's possible. So go out there and if you have Javante Williams, if you have a Najee Harris, send out an offer for Saquon Barkley plus a 2024 first. Because that 2024 first might turn into a Travion Henderson, who's a top running back in that class. So there's a lot of profit to be made on the Saquon Barkley trades out there. And I'm personally going to be trying to capitalize on them, trying to acquire uh, more Saquon Barkley while de-risking with that future first because that's really what that first does, right? It totally de-risks that injury risk of Saquon Barkley. If you can take a Javante Williams and Najee Harris and trade him for Saquon Barkley plus a first. 
It completely de-risks it because that first alone can be turned into the value of a Najee Harris, Javante Williams, but also if Saquon Barkley stays healthy, then you have a league winning trade. So everyone out there should be exploring that. But more importantly, you can just draft him super, super cheap in the fourth round. I would reach up a little, a few more picks to make sure I guarantee him in the fourth round. But let's take a look back at what type of team you can have, right? If you take the 2023 first and trade in for a third round or a fourth round startup pick, which is very, very possible in today's market, you could start a draft like this. Uh, you could have Lamar Jackson, Christian McCaffrey, right? Uh, Devontae Adams, Stephon Diggs, uh, Devontae Adams, Stephon Diggs, and Russell Wilson. Or like Stephon Diggs, Deontay Johnson, Russell Wilson. Uh, or Devontae Adams, Stephon Diggs, Saquon Barkley. Like there's so many possibilities. I would personally try and lock down both Lamar Jackson and Russell Wilson because I think those are two of the best quarterback values. But then you can layer on top of that a Christian McCaffrey, as Stephon Diggs and potentially Saquon Barkley, right? And that could be half your starting roster. And I don't know about you, but I would feel very, very comfortable going into the season with that as my starting roster. Uh, and, you know, and then let the injury gods do their thing and let the football gods bless me or curse me, whatever. But I would have played my chips on the table and felt damn good about pushing all my chips all in based on those players. So hopefully you guys enjoyed. Those are the list of players that I think are top values. I'll go over them again. At quarterback, you got Lamar Jackson, Kyler Murray, Trey Lance, all in the back part of the first round. Round two, you got Christian McCaffrey, potentially Tyree Kill, uh, but I prefer Christian McCaffrey if, if you have to make the choice. Round three, you have Devontae Adams available. And then round four, which is where the real value is, you have Stephon Diggs, potential wide receiver one overall next year, Russell Wilson, uh, back end quarterback one, Deontay Johnson, a wide receiver 15, and Saquon Barkley at RB13, who is technically not even a dynasty wide running back one overall anymore compared to any of uh, uh, compared to what the market is saying. So according to the market, Saquon Barkley is now a dynasty running back two. And to me, that's crazy. Maybe to some of you guys out there, that's not so crazy. But to me, there's not no way in hell that I think that he deserves to be there because he absolutely does have top three, top five league winning upside in him. And in, if you have top three, top five league winning upside, you're 25 years old as a running back. Uh, I think you should be going a lot higher than the fourth round. So that's what I got for you guys. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. If you did, make sure you hit the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button. Uh, and uh, I'll be back to you again next week. Next week, I actually have an interview. Uh, I'm going to have the, I don't know if you guys know him, but Jesse Reeves, uh, who was a dynasty uh, analytics OG, you know, went over, did his, tw his Twitch thing and uh, stream as a streamer, as a gamer, started from the bottom, went off on TikTok, all that stuff, but just really smart dude, really cool guy. I have him coming on, uh, and he'll, and that'll be the episode that drops, uh, in the following week. So after this week, so yeah, that's all I got for you guys. Make sure you guys subscribe, follow me, hit me up on Twitter, follow up the BDG D follow the entire big dogs team. Cause we'll be out here creating content for you all off season. All right. That's all I got for you guys until next time. Peace.